Okay. Um, welcome. <laughs> this is where you can find me, Paperform. Um, paperform.com.au at Paperform is my Insta and Twitter. I mean, I never who tweets anymore. That's what I know. Um, and this is one of the first things I made actually, which is uh, me if I was Victorian. Um, Victorian and uh, just a paper illu paper illustration. Uh, one of the very first things that I made. Um, so as you all know, I'm a paper engineer. Um, I've been doing my practice now for about 14 years. I founded my studio uh, in 2004. And basically we do anything and everything out of paper. So just let me actually take a check of the time. All right. Basically we do anything and everything out of paper. So um, we kind of tend to leave no stone unturned and uh, I really love the medium. It's a real challenge to keep on pushing myself and you know, discover new ways to be creative with it. Um, this is one of my favorite images here. Um, it's a mask that I did for a French paper company. They invited me to um, start a competition for them. And uh, off to the right is something we did for Adidas and Pharrell, um, which is like a, it's got this, it's a real sneaker in there, kind of like encased in a, a lobster of paper. Um, we do lots of illustrations. Uh, this is something I made for SBS, which is just a, this was like a kind of one day job. And uh, this is probably one of my favorite things I've made too, which is just a small mask. I love kind of making little kind of tiny objects out of paper, but we'll get to that more later. We do packaging as well. This is some, a bag we made for Telstra on the left here, which um, looks cool, but it wasn't super successful. Um, but, you know, sometimes things go wrong. That's the way it goes. And, uh, you know, we also do a lot of set design. So this is something we did recently for Vogue Living, which was just a, a little product page kind of moment. And uh, I just kind of like the shapes work together well. Uh, we also do pop-up books. That's probably where my passion started. Uh, and this is something we did for Kylie, which was part of her world tour. Uh, we kind of did a limited edition uh, pop-up for her Aphrodite world tour. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, she was awesome. I got to meet her in Hong Kong. She was great. She's, like, that big. Very cute. This is the first uh, project I did. So this is uh, – I studied at TAFE uh, here in Sydney. And uh, this was the – the first moment where we had a class in paper engineering, it was called paper construction in fact, but um, we kind of learnt very simple techniques on how to make pop-ups work and that kind of thing. And I got really excited by that idea. At the time, graphic design was very much about flash, and this is back in 2004, so it's quite a way back. Um, flash and very digital, and the, the whole analog moment hadn't really started yet. It was just kind of getting going. So I happened to be in the right place at the right time. The internet existed so people could find out about my work. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just kind of went, went gangbusters on the paper. My, my, my tutors thought I was a bit mad, but I, c I could kind of see a way through. You know, it's, um, I'm self-taught, so, as I said, we had a very basic class, but uh, everything you see beyond here is kind of something that I've kind of taught myself and explored through different techniques. Uh, this is some of, m some of my early works. Uh, you know, how do you start a career that doesn't really exist? Uh, when I first kind of learned about paper engineering. Well, I was interested in paper construction initially, and then I kind of did a bit of Google search and found that there is a career called paper engineering. And they mainly focus on pop-up books and things like that. But throughout um, my career, I've really tried to expand the whole idea of what is a paper engineer. Uh, and so, I kind of lost my train of thought, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I've done a lot of collaborations, and I, and I guess on this moment, this slide is kind of how do you create a how do you create a career out of nothing that really was there? Um, but I guess today the main focus is crafts. That's where we're going to start, and and really what I'm going to try and talk about is the actually the techniques. We're going to really get down to the nuts and bolts of what we do um, in terms of process, because I think it's probably a better way to describe how we work, and uh, you'll see the work will come through as we go as we go along. Um, you know, this is one of the very first projects I did that really tested me, and this is probably the moment where I kind of set the stage for my career. Um, this was a, I was invited by Hermes here in Australia to do their Christmas windows. And you know, when I set out, I really kind of wanted to be the best at what I did. It was kind of, I wanted to kind of like aim very high. And so this uh, project really kind of tested me. It was, um, I mean, I've subsequently done like loads of huge jobs, but this first one was really like quite tough. 30 days straight, kind of making paper feathers and paper wings, um, these beautiful delicate wings, which I still have a couple of uh, in my studio. But, you know, I mean, you only get one chance to, you know, make an impression with a company like this. So, you know, kind of really drove myself and it's kind of been a real tenant to what I've kind of done over the years. 
through uh, through my work. Um, I took this photo last night. This is my studio, which it's kind of hard to see, but it's a bit messy, really. Uh, <laughs> but I just want you to know where we work so you can kind of get a sense of what we do. Um, I've got two assistants now, so initially it was me by myself, and we've kind of like built the business as we've gone. Um, but you know, we've got my archive, there's like paper scraps everywhere, it's a very messy business. And these are the tools that we use, so I just wanted to also show how we, you know, very much uh, how we do what we do. Um, so scalpel, scissors, tweezers, uh, I've got a little Victoria Knox um, uh, pocket knife as a scoring thing, we use clips and glue, uh, dowels, things like that to help us roll paper and, um, you know, manipulate um, the medium. This is, I guess, I usually put this slide in for whenever I give a speech, but it's one of my favorite things that I have, um, you know, I've, I've seen. It's, uh, I've, I've got a real love of Japan and their culture and they have a real reverence for paper, etc. But this is a menu in Kyoto, um, in the restaurant that I was in. And it's, um, it's, it's basically like a shaving off a block of wood and it's like paper thin. And then the, uh, the daily menu has been written onto the wood and it, it just really, it comes back to the simplicity of paper as a very simple medium. And I like that idea that, you know, if you can wi subtract everything, you can kind of bring it down to the essence of what it is. And I always try and bring that tenant out in my work. So we use very simple techniques um, in the crafting of what we do. Um, and then we usually um, magnify that or, you know, use different kind of like design tools to help us kind of stay interested and, um, kind of keep variance in, in what we what we fabricate. Um, so this is, you know, apart from the, the tools I just showed you, we use a computer and a printer to help us with our nets and stuff like that, but I never use a computer to actually design for me. We only use Illustrator as a design tool, not something that kind of um, informs the work that we do. But these are really simple kind of uh, shapes that we all would really know. They're just flat nets. Uh, and I guess, this is where, you know, paper is such a simple m material, which I've said. And so it's really, how do you, after all these years, keep it interesting and keep on pushing, keep on exploring? Because I try and bring something new to every project that we do. Um, I mean, these nets here, you can see they're just like kind of prisms and cones. and But really, underlying everything that we do is a, a real mathematical principle to its basic geometry, really. And then over on the top of that, we just kind of lay a color and um, shape and, you know, bring that kind of interest out. So this is um, a, a tea set I made in paper, but it's, it's, it looks complicated, but it's actually relatively simple. We also do, you know, obviously rounded forms. So this kind of gives you some idea. This is some paper typography. It gives you some idea of the kind of level of detail that goes into these kind of things. And here's Park Life, which is uh, one of my early works, and you can kind of see the paper type there. Um, you know, we do a lot of biomimicry, I guess. I don't even know if that's the right kind of terminology, but we do, you know, paper, because paper is a natural material, it really, it's, it's kind of, it lends itself well to making natural things. So we make a lot of paper flowers and we do a lot of um, paper food, which you'll see. Um, this was something we did for Le Mer, um, which was like a, a lunch. Um, this is another more kind of... Um, this for T2, which was kind of like an activation on the front of their store. So it's kind of like a giant kind of like oversized chai uh, ingredients. You can see there. Repetition is something that we use a lot of. Um, so, you know, uh, it, this is another simple technique that we use all the time, which is basically, you know, simple shapes repeated or colors repeated. So on the left here, we have something we did for Penguin, which was a Christmas campaign. It doesn't have any of the books on there but um, you kind of get a sense. And then on the right is a little kind of sculpture I made for Oyster Magazine. Um, repetition en masse, you know. So this is something we did for the State Library of New South Wales uh, in collaboration with Dr. Lisa Cooper, who's a florist and an academic. And the exhibition was about gardens. And um, so we did this kind of huge installation uh, where members of the public were encouraged to come and build their own uh, flower and then add it to the wall. So it kind of went crazy, but you can kind of see, this is where it started. It was very simple. Got, it was really cool, that one. Um, I mean, the simplest technique is probably the crush. You know, when you have a bit of paper, you scrunch it. And uh, you can do it artfully, though. And this is something that we did for the Climate Council, which is, uh, we kind of made this cool mountain. I love this one. Axis Mundi, I called it. 
Um, and it just goes to show you that even if you crush things with care and a bit of dry ice and some good photography, you can make a great image. Um, this is, you know, paper is quite noble and it's quite subtle. And when you strip it all away and you just use the white of paper, I think that's really when it sings. And this is kind of that great moment. This is a folding cover I made for architect Shigeru Ban, who was pitching to build a building here in Sydney. And uh, in collaboration with Greg Anderson from Trigger Design. And uh, this is one of my very early, early pieces, but I just, yeah, love that kind of like noble simplicity of paper. I mean, I guess one of the simplest techniques you could do is strips. So just like long, thin strips. This is uh, two different projects. One is for Hotel Hotel in Canberra. They uh, fix and make. They invited members of the public to donate broken objects. And then um, artists and designers were asked to um, kind of repair these objects. And uh, so that's kind of what I came up with, this kind of crazy little voodoo dude. Uh, <laughs> I love getting into like the story behind what we do, you know. Um, the uh, and the one on the right is a mask I made for a group exhibition called "For He Made She Made," and then you know if you take this simple idea of strips and then you magnify it, um, this is a project that we did for the NGV uh, Melbourne Book Fair, and uh, we took just kind of big strips of um, paper and we hung them up in the grand hall, and uh, I mean it's the same technique, just here it is out the back before it was like kind of unrolled. So I just kind of thought that was a cool photo good colors. We've been doing more and more large things um, in terms of t talking about scale. So uh, this is a job we did at Toowoom for in Toowoomba at the end of last year. Um, this is probably one of the biggest jobs we've done. I mean, you can't, it's hard to get a sense of the scale, but this, uh, these uh, sculptures are like eight meters long and um, really large. And you know, more flowers for spring, groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, flowers, there's a bit of a battle with flowers because everyone loves flowers and I think, you know, people keep on asking me to make flowers and I'm like, okay, we've done the flowers now, but, you know, if that's what pays the bills, I will make flowers. <laughs> <laughs> um, another giant thing, uh, I'm just going to show you, you know, we hanging things is a, is a bit of a nightmare really, but we've done a lot of really big hanging things. This was um, for the big design market down in Melbourne um, and uh, it took a whole day to kind of get this giant thing installed. And another hanging floral moment uh, for the QVB uh, for their spring uh, three or four years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but um, yeah, interesting. I mean, he, he because the flowers were so large, we had to use kind of more foam core and stuff like that. But I'll talk about materials further in a second. Um, and this is something we did for the Sydney Festival, which was a nine meter um, sculpture for Kirin, which is based on Kirin. So it was like a mythical dragony beast. And this is like just a kind of, a, I guess, a centerpiece or a, a focal point for the Sydney Festival um, at that time. And I mean, the funny story about this, uh, three three years ago, it was like that summer was pouring with rain and um, for like torrential rain for days. And then this thing just really copped it. It got so wet and saggy. And but um, yeah, you never know. It's always raining or windy whenever I take paper out of the studio. I don't know what it is. It just like always happens. Um, so from the ridiculously huge to the miniature, the tiny, um, you know, paper is great when it's fetishized on a tiny scale. And I think people really get into that. You know, everyone loves tiny little paper objects some little paper plants we made. Um, up in the top right, uh, my assistant Vanessa is kind of doing the center of some tiny flower with some tweezers. And then uh, down on the right bottom is the shoes from that shaggy dude from Hotel Hotel, which I kind of wanted a pair of shoes like that, so I made them for him. <laughs> um, and some more miniature moments. Like this is one of my early works, High Tea, which was um, kind of, yeah, still very popular today. Um, and off to the right is uh, something we did for Bell magazine. Uh, just a little paper scene, little housey thing. Um, I mean, if you haven't noticed already, colour is something that we love to use as a tool. I mean, I didn't realise how important and special colour is to me until I really got kind of got stuck into my career, but I love colour. This is something that we did for the um, Taste Foods Festival here in Sydney and Melbourne last year, and uh, the whole idea here was to throw the colour off in this food objects and, and do something that was a little bit quirky and different, so yeah. Um, another technique that I've tried recently is weaving paper, which is really fascinating. I, I bought this uh, kind of stuff, this fencing from Bunnings, which is kind of plastic. I try not to use plastic in my work, by the way. We try and focus mainly on paper. But, um, and then I bought a whole bunch of like paper raffia and kind of like did this really cool weaving thing and uh, made a paper textile. It was eventually displayed in Barangaroo at the Standard Store as like a social kind of activation. 
and uh, a beautiful paper textile, which is yeah something innovative. I've never tried that before. And here's another thing I tried recently, which is papier mache. I've never really done that, but this is kind of my take on it. So we had a lot of the um, leftover paper, our scraps from the studio, and we shredded it all up and kind of like mixed it all up in glue and kind of made these molds. And uh, I mean, the, the conical ones are two lampshades that I found on the street. And um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we also, this part here is like we kind of made like flat pa like flat sheets of paper as a, as a different kind of way of... Um, so in about 2012, I kind of got to the point where I thought that, you know, I'd kind of done everything with paper that you possibly could do, which is very foolish to think that. Because <laughs> it's such an amazing medium, it just keeps on giving and keeps on giving. But, you know, um, I this is a, a self... Um, this is a show a show I, I made for, uh, called New Platonic, which was a series of geometric interlocking um, forms that uh, kind of w created these kind of like geometric tapestries. Um, and the whole premise here is no glue. So at that point, I kind of, when I was feeling a bit frustrated with my paper moment, I kind of thought, well, how can I change my approach? And so I kind of stripped everything back, took away the glue, took away the tape and thought, you know, let's just focus on paper as its own thing, you know? So... Um, we, uh, well, I, sh I should say I, um, made this series of like kind of cool, awesome paper tap tapestries. And the funny thing about this was that just when I thought I'd reached the point where I kind of didn't have anything more to discover, you know, this whole other world opened up and suddenly this technique of not using any paper, sorry, any glue, pardon me, um, also here, we, here you can go see, um, me kind of like weaving these kind of like giant, and then this is kind of what the nets look like when they're, when they're unfolded. Um, and uh, and so subsequently, this kind of whole technique of not using glue has become a real cornerstone of my practice. Um, this is a series of headdresses we made for Hermes in Germany, and the whole idea was that the uh, it was for their summer party, and they had like some fancy party in a chateau. And the whole idea was that the guests would arrive, and the docents would um, fold them. Um, a headdress to wear for this kind of like fancy ball. And uh, I mean, these are some of my masterpieces that I made. Um, it's kind of a little bit difficult to see the one at the top, but anyway, they're, they're beautiful things. I'm very proud of those. And the, the interlocking moment carries on. So this is something we did for Nike for Air Max Day a few, few years back. Um, and this is kind of, uh, we were given Tinker Hatfield as our inspiration and the, the Centre Pompidou, um, and which was the original inspiration for the Air Max shoe. So we kind of did our floating air factory um, based on Pompidou Centre. And so here is just paper and fishing line hanging in space, which is very cool. Um, more about, you know, I love how the materials, um, Henry Wilson's a uh, product designer and a good friend of mine, and he uh, challenged me to um, work with these brass cones here, you can see, to create a folding lampshade. So this is, um, you know, a no glue moment again, um, and it was um, displayed in, um, in Milan at the Salone, which was a very proud moment for me, um, having it attended quite a few times before that. But, uh, you know, I just love how the, 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 the the bronze and the paper work together. It's like a really nice kind of interaction and intersection between something heavy and soft. And, and once again, magnifying uh, this simple kind of like interlocking no glue moment. This is something that we did for the house, which is a, um, you know, the, the whole premise is to look at funerals in a new way. And so they uh, kind of uh, commissioned me to make a, a paper chapel. And so this is like kind of like interlocking giant geometric moments that kind of, you can kind of create like a volume or a space. Now this does need support to stand up, but it's, yeah, it's not bad. Um, you know, materials, let's talk about materials. Like in that last one, you know, we kind of use something like Gatorboard. I don't know if you've heard about that, but we kind of, so, you know, there's a lot of different materials that we use that beyond paper that help us kind of support what we do and, you know, kind of amplify and magnify what we do. Um, so foam core is, uh, you know, a really important part of, of our studio. Um, off to the left here is some large origami animals that we made and you know foam core in this particular instance is used as a supporting moment to kind of give rigidity to the paper. And um, off, to the r um, off to the right is you know here we've used foam core as like the center of like some floral stamens. This is kind of like a little whip. Um, but we also use foam core as like a something dense that we can kind of like attach onto and like the um, gives it kind of more strength to the center of of a flower, for example, and we've also used like paper satay skewers. Uh, so pardon me, um, 
this bamboo saute skewers here too. So we use a lot of saute skewers and those kind of things to help us support what that kind of stuff. And we also use a lot of foam core in terms of maquettes and, and building models. So um, this is the maquettes for the uh, large flower floral thing in Toowoomba that we I showed you earlier. But you can kind of see it's really such a versatile medium um, uh, foam core. It's great. Leather is another thing that we've done. Uh, so I was invited after I did the initial work with Hermes, I was invited to Paris to collaborate with the artisans there and we um, we fabricated this uh, pop-up book in leather. And it's based on the corners of Hermes luggage, which is quite distinct in the way that their geometric kind of the leather is folded. So we d I did a series of pop-up books on that. Um, yeah, beautiful. I mean, obviously leather works similar and plastic and those kind of things work in a similar way. So all of our kind of knowledge kind of like links in. Um, Perspex rods, this is something that we did recently for Samsung. Uh, they asked us to kind of create a window moment for their launch of their new, I think it's an S9, we'll have a look, um, phone. But, um, and uh, so it's hard to see in this light on the right there, but um, the, we kinda the, the key visual was a dandelion, a kind of glowing dandelion. So we had this kind of center core of a light and then kind of the, um, the Perspex rods kind of coming out. And so each of the tips was lit at the end of edge of the, um, Edge of the dandelion, and this was on George Street at the at the um, flagship store. Very cool. We had kind of like glowing from behind and stuff. It was yeah, all right. It was all right. Um, you know, often we have to. S no, I shouldn't say often. Sometimes we have to. You know, um, cust have custom frames made. So steel and metal is another thing that we use every now and then. This is something we did for the galleries Victoria, which is uh, for Chinese New Year, and it was like a l some large. Um, pinwheels, uh, thousands of pinwheels on m mounted onto these metal frames. And as the wind came through, the <laughs> it kind of like blew and they all kind of like twirled. It was quite cool, that one. The big ones didn't turn so big because they were a bit heavy, but beautiful. I love these photos. That one on the left there, nice color. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit more about our process. I'm, I mean, how, how am I going? Uh, I'm doing all right? Okay. This is another MS job that you know we recently photographed, and um, so that's kind of why it's like fresh. I haven't, but we were commissioned to make um, some headdresses for a, a party, uh, and uh, we it was based on the work of this uh, artist called Robert Dallet, and he did a bit like big cats and stuff like that. So we kind of went to town on these um, crazy cat masks that the people wore, but I just kind of wanted to show you. I mean, these are, this is obviously the end result, but I just kind of wanted to show you how we work. So, you know, it's r usually just a series of models, really, and we kind of like building complexity or simplicity as we go. Um, so, you know, on the left here is really rough, you know what I mean? Just kind of like feeling it out, lots of blue tack and very loose. And um, on the right, kind of getting a little bit tighter, adding in a bit of color, seeing how it might work. And then, on the left is more the form itself coming together. So kind of developing that and building that and then kind of adding more detail as we go. All the cats lined up. Me and me wearing wearing one of them. And then kind of like building on the fur, the detail, you know, so the layers, layers, layers as we go up. So um, once again, you know, this was obviously, uh, you know, very detailed, uh, detailed expression. And, you know, and uh, th the black guy down, the, the one in the corner, he's like almost ha impossible to see. But, uh, and, you know, so this is kind of like the out end result. And, you know, it was a lot of fun actually shooting these because we kind of like one of my assistants made this rig and we kind of like, you know, m mapped it all out and very cool. Um, I mean, that's kind of really nearing the end of what I was going to, of my talk. But, I kind of wanted to end on this last one, which is, you know, um, I got invited to to be the artist for the Sydney New Year's Eve fireworks in 2016-17. And I guess this kind of comes down to why I do what I do. Um, you know, what a great honour as a Sydney as a Sydney cider born and bred to be asked to do something like that, you know. Um, so we made this model for the city of Sydney based on all of the local flora and fauna of Sydney. And I mean, we clocked, I don't know how many hours we clocked on this one, maybe about 500 hours, ma man hours or something. It was madness. But, you know, once again, you only get one chance to do something like the New Year's Eve for the City of Sydney. 
And uh, so we just went absolutely bonkers on it. And uh, the the city acquired this artwork, so it's part of their permanent collection now. So that's a great honour. And recently it was displayed um, in the town hall and uh, for the 175th anniversary of the city of Sydney. And it was object number 175. So that was very, very cool. And, uh, you know, I mean, I guess, how do you top that? I don't know. Where do I, where do I go to from here? Um, here are some interesting um, shots of it around town. But, um, I mean... And, you know, there it is up on the bridge. So it was a very emotional day, that one. But uh, it's hard to see. They're just kind of on the pylons. But I guess, you know, it's been such an exciting journey. Who would have thought that you could make a career out of paper? Not me. It was a complete serendipity that I fell into it. But, um, I, uh, you know, I'm just really excited about what's next. Who knows? There's lots on the cards at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to survive the next month. But, uh <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, follow your passion and do what you love. And keep at it and work hard and that's really the sim the simplest way to be successful is just to keep working you know what i mean and i think you know good luck happens to hard workers so uh that's my recommendation and if you find what you love then you know do that mm. so that's about it really <laughs> <laughs> i think I, d I think i went all right yeah i, I didn't do, i didn't like, i didn't do, do too i didn't know if i'd be like over or under Um, that was so great. Thank you so much for sharing all that. So we have a lot of time for Q&A. So guys, think, think about um, some questions to ask. Um, I've got the mic, so I'm going to start. Um, so my question is, I think I read somewhere when I was, I was doing a lot of research, kind of stalking Benja. Um, and um, I think I read somewhere that you didn't like your work being seen as craft. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that and, and why that is? Yes, I, I I did mean to mean to mention that at the beginning, but you know. <laughs> anyway, I mean, look, it was interesting. Like when I first started, craft was a, in my in my own mind, it was a bit of a dirty word in a way because you know it it was quite important for me because thinking about paper is a it's kind of maybe a bit juvenile or maybe it's not it's not quite quite a serious moment. So you know, for me, it was really important to label myself as a paper engineer and really take it as like a technical a technical approach to paper and more serious so that people would kind of like view us in that way so but now I, I, I think I embrace the word craft in fact because you know it, it's it's you know it's it's about the craft of what we do the crafting of paper you know so it, it, it really resonates with me and my practice that kind of word actually now um, whereas initially it was like kind of something I was like yeah. mm. okay. I have another question um, was there a moment that everything just went to shit and you wanted to give up? And if so, what was it? Like stressful, maybe? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it happens like every <laughs> every three months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've just been working with. I've got to go to a photo shoot after this, like directly after this. Um, and you know, we've just been working for like the last four weeks, like mad, crazy people. Um, I mean, uh, no, I don't think I've wanted to give up, but there's definitely hard times, you know, I mean, working, running your own business and, you know, the deadlines that we have, it's a very time consuming moment. So, you know, it's always a lot of pressure to kind of deliver on time. Um, so sometimes it can be hard and you have to stay awake all night or, you know, just like do what it takes. But I guess that's, yeah. yeah. What else would I do really? <laughs> okay. Um, one last question before I open it up to you guys. Um, I'm so interested in the fact that you obviously use both hemispheres of your brain a lot, um, being you're incredibly creative, but you're also incredibly mathematical and technical. Um, where where do you think that comes from? And um, how, I don't know, I guess how, how do you, because I, I think that's quite rare. So can you talk a little bit about that? And just, I guess, where it comes from? And maybe is that something you've always, as a child, you were always like that? Or, or did you have to develop one over the other? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I mean, my parents, let's start with my parents, my dad's a civil engineer, so he builds bridges and, you know, he's got that big, big kind of like building moment, we used to build a lot of models with him as a kid, um, and we were always making stuff for our Star Wars figures out of paper and satay skewers, and, you know, being, <laughs> it was a very creative childhood I had with my brother, and my mum's a, a amongst many things, a children's book author, so, you know, we used to have a lot of pop-up books as kids, and, you know, so, I guess there was a, maybe a bit of a synergy, but um, yeah, I guess I do possess that kind of moment of 
technical but kind of composition and color and, and I just yeah whereas my assistants actually my two assistants um one is really into that kind of like problem solving technical moment and then the other is much more about color and composition and so like as a trio we kind of like work really well together and we kind of like vibe off one another mm mm Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Do I stress about like the longevity of my work? I mean, no, I actually like the temporal nature of it. I mean, it's I like that aspect of it. Y you know, paper will last for thousands of years if you care for it uh, as evidence in in our books and, you know, all of our documents that we have from, you know, generations ago um, and definitely paper does fade if you have it in the light so my studio is quite dark actually luckily so it's like kind of keeps it um, keeps the color there but as far as the delicacy of it I like that kind of ephemeral nature of it and you know if it gets trashed or whatever that's fine you know I mean w sometimes we keep our works sometimes I give it to the client sometimes it goes in the bin it just depends really um, what the moment is if I'm quite attached to it but yeah no I mean I don't know if, so if some if something makes it through that'd be lovely but it doesn't really matter if it doesn't either you know um, yeah mm. thank you Hello? Yeah, good question. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I'm definitely, uh, how do I maintain the balance between working and running my business in terms of like the craft? I mean, uh, you know, we, we've been at it for like 14 years now and it's definitely a business now, you know, like what was my passion and my hobby um, has definitely become a business. So it's like a lot more emailing and, you know, tax and you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, you know, trademarks. I mean, there's a whole other thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm kind of enjoying that challenge of the new, um, the new, the new kind of like era in, in paper form. Um, I'm also launching another new company, another small paper company shortly. So, you know, I, I'm really kind of getting into that business aspect of it. And, um, I mean, I've made so much stuff out of paper now that, that I'm not super excited about making more paper flowers, for example. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, I still love it and, and and really enjoy that kind of when I get into the groove, yeah, it's it's great. But um, d definitely more of a business these days, which is fine actually. I don't mind at all. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point in terms of like you know, initially we used to quote all the time, but I mean, I don't even bother quoting now because it. A, it takes me ages, but B, you know, I mean, clients know what they need to spend these days, so it's just better off to say to a client, what's your budget, you know what I mean? Because then we can just tailor what we do to that amount of money, you know? Um, because at the end of the day, whilst we are creative, this is a commercial operation and we need to pay our rent and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, it does come down to that. Um, and, you know, I still make mistakes all the time um, in like overcharging or, uh, sorry, pardon me, undercharging. Um, and because I always want to give the best, you know what I mean? Like every project I see as a chance to excel. And, and so, but, you know, we're getting better at it. We're getting, we're getting better at, at, at getting the right price for what we do. Yeah. Hello? Mm. Correct. How did I go about creating my career that didn't exist? Um, uh, look, I don't really know. It's just serendipity, you know, hard work. I mean, a, a lot of luck in the right right place, right time. And uh, my friends as well really helped me. Um, I think if you just really, if you really want something, it just happens, you know what I mean? Like uh, I was a graphic designer for um, eight years and on the weekends and at nights I do my paper engineering and slowly it built, built, built until the point where I was like, I just didn't have time to even do my laundry because I was working so much. So I was like, right, maybe it's time to actually go freelance. But I think, you know, I'm a yes man. I always try and say yes to everything. I hate saying no or turning jobs away because I just think, as I said, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get, I think. A and so um, it's just been a bit of luck really and a lot of hard work. But, you know, that's, it's just serendipity. That's what I put it down to. Mm. Hello? 
how do I start with the brief? I'm not really a drawer because what we do is very 3D and, and real. I usually just get straight into cutting because it's, you know, it's just simpler that way. Yeah, drawing. I mean, so we do a lot of mood boards these days to kind of like get the job, you know what I mean? People say, okay, what's your ideas? We might lay out like three different ideas and we kind of like colors and blah, blah, blah. And then we kind of do that really simply and then we kind of just get into the making of it. But I'm, I'm getting quite good at knowing how to approach things now. So we don't, there's not usually too much mucking around. Mm. I'll ask someone to answer. Go on, hello. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, the city of Sydney are very particular, and uh, there's a lot of legalities around what they do. So, with regards to how much was m how much was this me, and how much was this, was this them? I mean, they really knew kind of what they wanted in this particular moment. It had to be Sydney, and it had to be flora and fauna. But then, within those confines, we were allowed to be as creative as we as we wanted, really. But I mean, they were they were pretty tough. They're pretty tough on me. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> we got there in the end. <laughs> 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 Hello? Yes. Yes. Have I integrated digital into some of my paperwork? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, this whole digital thing, like... Y <laughs> I think we're, we're humans. We're natural. We're natural beings, and everything natural is what resonates with us. So the whole paperless society thing. I don't know if that's. I mean, maybe it'll happen in four hundred years. Who knows? But I hope it doesn't. Because um, when you think about it, I mean, you know, uh, the a thumb drive or a computer can just go wrong so easily, and a book is so much harder to destroy. You know what I mean? So think about like the way that information can be saved. Um, I love the analog nature of it. It really makes me happy. I mean, I'm always plugged into my phone too. I'm hooked on that thing. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So you know, I'm. I like the analog. It's we're humans. You know, we're natural. Mm. It's part of it. And you know, that's why cork and pottery and all that kind of natural material is really having a, a real boom moment. You know, and craft isn't a dirty word anymore. It's really like a feasible design expression. You know, and people are really vibing on it. So I think that's kind of goes to show how important that analog thing is to us, and I don't think we're going to lose it anytime soon. Yes. Yes, yes, I mean, uh, recycle... Um, do we recycle? We recycle all of our spare paper, of course, but I mean, w I don't buy recycled paper because, you know, the, the purity of the color is really important. I mean, sometimes we use brown card or whatever if it's necessary or pertinent, but, um, you know, the purity of color is, so we use like fresh paper, you know what I mean? But, um, I mean, it's a su sustainable resource, you know, and plastic, as far as plastic goes, I mean, I went to a design talk recently and, you know, plastic's not necessarily a bad material, it's just how we use it and what, what, objects we make with it, you know, and like how, so, I mean, plastic's not necessarily that bad, but I try and like, eliminate it as much as I possibly can in the work that we do, because there's so much plastic around already, it's crazy. Hello? Uh, um, not really. <laughs> I was a terrible graphic designer. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm an art director now and a creative director and, you know, I've kind of become that. But, like, as far as graphic design goes, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I guess, my kind of, like, through road. Um, I mean, I love books. I'm, I've been trying to read more, so, lately. Um, and, uh, but probably not, I mean, maybe, who knows? You never say never yet. Hello? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's kind of what I was talking about before with this new business uh, that we're... I mean, yes, yes, yeah. I mean, we've got 12 years of archives that we should share, we're going to share, you know what I mean? So it'll it'll come, you know, we've been working on it for ages, but <laughs> it's like hard to launch a new thing when you've got everything else, you've got to keep your business going and then you've got to like do your laundry and, you know. <laughs> Uh, this gentleman was asking if we do like smaller or larger. Either the smaller or large projects that are 
Oh, it's definitely the large ones. I mean, the small ones, you know, like, I mean, I, I think I've kind of like reached a cutoff limit in terms of like what we'll actually take on these days because, you know, a $2,000 budget is like, forget it. Like, wh what are we going to make for $2,000, you know? And it just depends. And sometimes I might be right, you know, and we'll say, yes, we need to pay our rent this, this month. We'll take that job, you know? Um, but, uh, I mean, the bigger jobs are better, and we try and get those larger jobs because that's where the real value is, you know, and what we do, and, um, yeah. But, I mean, every now and then, sure. Inspired? How do I keep finding inspiration? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the city, I, I try and... I, I'm always looking, you know, I think... Um, is it... I'm just trying to think. She's a lady with red hair from Vogue. Um, she was an editor there, Grace Coddington. Coddington. Uh, yes. um, you know, she said, "Always keep your eyes open." Her one of her teachers taught her that, and and it really struck me because you know, uh, in the urban environment, I mean, you, you've seen that we're inspired by nature in what we do, but also the urban environment is there's so much um, uh, inspiration there too, and you can really solve a lot of. I've solved some real really difficult design challenges just by seeing the way the bricks come together or the way that metal works or I mean the city of Tokyo which is probably you know my biggest inspiration um, I mean it's full of texture and geometry and you know it's, it's such an inspiring place and, and I see kind of like a lot of yeah interesting things in that moment um, so yeah I'm always trying to keep my eyes open and look 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 all the time mm. Mm. hello Mm. Um, I think it was important for me to be an a paper engineer at the beginning. Um, as I said, because of that technical moment and trying to like bring a, uh, a seriousness to what we do. I mean, now I'm a paper artist, sure, or a, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take anything really because we've done so much now. You know, I mean, I'm definitely an artist, aren't I? And I'm definitely a paper engineer, and so. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah. I mean, I'm a paper engineer. I think I, th I like the w I like the way pa paper engineer. It sounds it sounds right for me. But yeah, paper artists will do. <laughs> yes. How do I work out the, the like the costings? Um, we can do a daily rate, you know. Um, but as I said, it's it's more like um, a budget moment. So they say we've got to do this display. We've got five, ten, twenty, whatever it is, and we say, okay, we can do this for that, you know. So it's it works better that way, and it saves time as well, because who's got the time to write like massive quotes all the time? It's boring. <laughs> Hello. Where do I source my paper from? I used to go to the art shop and buy it all the time, but. Um, it's too expensive there. <laughs> it costs so much money. Um, it's funny, you know, paper, it's lately, um, it's uh, over the last couple of years, it's the quality's been going down, but the price has been going up. I don't know the outsource, I don't know if anyone's noticed that. But um, so now, I mean, I, I, I tend to specifically use Color Plan, which is a um, kind of cool range of papers from England. Um, and the best thing about that is the color, you know, like they have a huge range of colors. So that's kind of what draws us there. And um, I've just got a guy who I call up and he delivers, which is fantastic. <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I usually just tend to, um, do I add paint? Not really. I mean, I've done a couple of bit of that every now and then, but no, I just usually tend to use the pure paper as it comes. Mm. That one, that one, that QVB moment was um, actually made off-site. So um, we designed it, and then it was like uh, through my overseeing, it was like manufactured by someone else, and then they trucked it all there. Yeah, but I mean, as I said, it's always raining or windy, raining or windy, whatever. I've got paper, and you know, we usually carry it in boxes or whatever. Or you know, often um, if it's like, for example, the Toowoomba job, it kind of came in parts and we had to ship it up on the back of a truck and we had to wrap it all carefully. Then you kind of like a, a assemble it all. Um, mm, mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's called like what's my what's the white paper I always go for? Um, it's just a night vellum, 180 GSM. I don't know, bog standard A3 in size. You know, I buy it in like 400 sheets ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff though. <laughs> it's good for modeling, you know, that kind of white stuff. It, yeah, it's easy to work with. And, mm. One more question. Here we go. Hello. Mm. Um, yes, I mean there 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 are some fantastic paper engineers from America. I mean and England as well and France actually, um, and obviously Japan um, and Asia is a you know a paper is very important in Asia. Um, you know in terms of pop ups, there were uh, one guy in New York who I contacted right from the start, and he was like, no, look, we're not really interested, blah blah blah. So I was like, I just have to teach myself. So can you t tell me your question again? Just experimentation. I'm just really inquisitive, you know, like as it kind of like plays back into that whole looking thing as well. Like I've just got a thirst for knowledge and I'm very kind of like interested in how things work. Um, and uh, so it's just kind of playing really and kind of like experimentation and what, and you know, what doesn't work. And I find often we have to go down a road. You might spend a day or two walking down some road and you kind of get to the end of it and you're like, well, that didn't work. And you just kind of go back and, you know, start again. So, yeah, it's just a lot of trial and error really. And, um, now I've kind of got to the point where I kind of know where we're heading before we start, so we don't have to, but you know, every now and then, you know, you never know what happens. Um, all right, last one. Yes. Yes, um, how did I first get that job with Hermes? I'd, I'd, I'd done a, um, a pop-up book for um, Harper's Bazaar, and the editor of Harper's, um, recommended me on you know so i mean just another fortuitous moment in my career but certainly an important one um and uh yeah i mean i haven't really looked back <laughs> yeah. um awesome well thank you all right here we go i've got um one more question what was um your worst paper cut Okay, okay, I actually do have a story. Because people often ask me, do you have paper? I, I've been getting more and more paper cuts lately. You know, foam core can really give you a bad paper cut too. Um, I, my hands are all slashed after this job I'm doing. But the worst paper cut I ever had was we were in Tokyo doing a job. And it was like really full on and very intense. I didn't sleep for two days to get this job done, right? And we, I literally stayed awake for two days. And... Um, and we were kind of like rapidly like creasing stuff, and I I kind of got a paper cut here in here, but then I got a paper cut in that paper cut, ah, which was really not good. After not sleeping for two days, I was like, <laughs> 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 thank you, like. <laughs> 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 <laughs>